Hello and welcome to week six of this course on international human rights law in Kashmir, prospects and challenges. This week, we will discuss the right to freedom of speech and expression with our expert speaker, Dr. David Kay. David is a clinical professor at the University of California. Uh, from 2014 to 2020, he served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. He is also the author of Speech uh, Police, The Global Struggle to Govern the Internet, a 2019 publication. A member of several boards dealing with freedom of expression, online and offline, since October 2020, he has been serving as the independent chair of the Board of the Global Network Initiative. He has also written for international and American law journals and numerous media outlets. He began his legal career with the US State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is a former member of the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law. We're very delighted to have you with us, uh, David. The floor is all yours. Great. Samir, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to you and your colleagues uh, for inviting me to, to join you all today. Um, I, as, as some of you may or may not know, for six years, as, as Samir uh, indicated, I was the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression. And during that time, it became clear to me, as I think it became clear to everybody around the world long before, that uh, freedom of expression and freedom of, freedom of opinion, the center of gravity for discussions around these kinds of issues moved to online space. And so what I wanna really try to focus on today as much as possible is the way in which these fundamental freedoms, these fundamental human rights that are guaranteed under international human rights law, human rights law that is binding on all states and specifically binding on India, for example, um, that, that all of these laws now play a significant role in our online lives, perhaps in a way that before the advent of the digital age, we didn't quite appreciate. Uh, and, and in that sense, I mean that, look, we're, we're having our conversation today on, um, on Zoom. Excuse me, this is, this is my, it's a morning in Washington, DC. So I'm getting my uh, morning injection of caffeine, which is always necessary. Um, but we, we notice now how much of our lives are mediated not only by private actors, but also by governments that are both regulating those companies, right? Whether it's the shutdown of the internet as some of you may have directly experienced over the last several years or the shutdown of communications, or it's the decision-making of companies to decide what is and is not appropriate speech and debate. Um, often doing so in a rather opaque kind of way. So what, what I'm going to do is share a, a screen here, if I can do that to, to start this lecture. Um, and here we go. I hope you all can see that. Does that look, uh, looks good? So, so I, the issues of freedom of expression today, I think have become in some respects, some of the most uh, direct uh, and some of the most salient issues, not only of law, but of public policy around the world. And we can just think about what those issues are, right? Hate speech, misogyny, racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, all of those kinds of, of issues, all of that kind of, of speech and content that many people around the world face in part as an effort to silence them, right? And yet it's also speech. So how do we think about those issues? Who should decide what can be restricted and what can be allowed? What about fake news, propaganda, voter disinformation, terrorism, violent extremism, internet shutdowns and website blockings? All of these issues have an intersection with freedom of expression, uh, that is guaranteed under international human rights law. 
And we're at a kind of a fundamental uh, turning point in a way in global public policy because of this general confusion in many parts of the democratic world as to who should decide these issues. Should it be the companies, which of course have their own version of freedom of expression that they may enjoy because they are also private actors, they are creating space, they're creating brands. Should it be governments that particularly in democratic rule of law oriented societies should have a role in determining the scope of protection and the scope of promotion of freedom of expression and freedom of opinion uh, in their societies? Who should be deciding these questions? And with all of this, where do, the, where do users fall? Where do, where do we as individuals fall? So the kinds of questions I want us to address today, and, and as I highlight this, uh, I'll, I'll indicate some of these questions, and, and these are questions that I hope that we can address in some detail in the Q&A, because I won't cover all of this. Um, I think you may notice that, that my style will be a little bit more to raise questions than to answer them, but hopefully we can address some of these and drill down into them in the Q&A. But these are some of the questions that I think are pertinent. How should individual rights be protected online? How should people and communities be protected online? What law should govern online speech? And that's perhaps a more difficult question than it seems on the surface. Of course, we might all, we might all say that if you are speaking in the UK or you're speaking in India or you're speaking in Australia or the United States, wherever you might be, the law that should govern should be the law where you're located. But that doesn't really answer the question of what law should be applied, what sources of law should be applied by the companies themselves in the sense that they are global uh, companies with global reach. Should it be law or company policies in terms of ser service that, that, that determine the scope of rights online? So th these are some of the questions that we'll talk about today or that I'll, I'll kind of introduce and then we can talk about them in the Q&A uh, to some extent a little bit more. I will absolutely uh, try to keep my, my speaking to under 45 minutes, hopefully closer to 35 or so, but um, usually when I say that I'll speak less, I end up speaking more, so I should be careful. Okay, so let's start with, um, with some uh, sort of fundamentals. So um, as you, you may all know, and you've probably all discussed already, in the, um, in the course of your work and your studies, international human rights law uh, begins in some respects with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948. I won't go into all of the details uh, here, but, but I think we know that the Universal Declaration, as its title suggests, is a non-binding instrument that over time, because of its aspirational quality, and also because of the way in which it's been implemented by states around the world has in many respects ripened in a kind of, into a kind of standard for human rights law, a kind of conversion from soft law to harder law around the world. And it's usually considered to be the baseline for thinking about fundamental human rights. Provides minimum standards, let's say. It wasn't until 1966 that, um, and, and honestly through the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, a little bit after that in the 90s and the early part of this millennium, that governments began to convert the language of the Universal Declaration, to convert that aspirational set of, uh, of priorities, let's say, for human rights protection and promotion to convert that and to codify that into binding international law. And for the purposes of the freedom of opinion and expression, the place that we start is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was concluded in 1966. Um, about 170 states are party to the ICCPR or the covenant, I'll call it either ICCPR or covenant as I, as I speak. Uh, so it is 
in fact, one of those treaties that is, is not only a central treaty in international human rights law, but also as far as global instruments go, it is one of the most um, adhered to treaty, most ratified treaty uh, in existence. For our purposes, for the freedom of expression, we look to Article 19, both of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or, or we say, and the Covenant's Article 19. Makes it easy for us to talk about uh, the provisions because it's Article 19 uh, in any case. Right, so Article 19, and here we'll focus on the ICCPR, provides a kind of, what I would say, robust protection of the rights to freedom of opinion and to freedom of expression. So if you look here, Article 19, paragraph one, provides that everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference. This is pretty bold language, and it's language that does not provide for an exception, right? It's the right to hold opinions without interference. And as we go forward in a moment, I'll highlight how it is even further uh, emphasized that the right to hold an opinion, it cannot be subject to any restriction by the state. But if you think about the right to hold an opinion, I'd like you to think a little bit, and perhaps over the course of the lecture um, or in our Q&A, think a little bit about what it might mean to hold an opinion in the digital age, right? Typically, if we think about the time in which this language first arose, which was actually in the Universal Declaration, so in the 1940s, or if we think about it here in 1966 when it was concluded, right? We might think of the right to hold an opinion as, you know, the 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 opinions that we put into our diaries, or the opinions that we hold in in our heads, and and if we think in those terms, we can think, well, of course, the state shouldn't have access to what's in our heads, what's in our minds, right? And and that means, of course, further that we don't want the state to be able to undertake the kinds of operations that would get into or influence your opinion uh, in, um, in an interfering sort of way, whether it might be brainwashing or it might be the kind of, the kind of things that a government might do, such as um, because of your opinion, which might be shown by your membership in a disfavored dissenting organization, uh, that the government might detain you, uh, subject you to something like re-education camps or something like that. That kind of interference is what essentially those who drafted Article 19, Paragraph 1, I think had in mind. But if we think about the digital age, right, the right to hold an opinion now has extended well beyond only what we might write in a diary which we might you know, lock up and put into, uh, into a safe in our, you know, in our homes. Um, and perhaps if there's a criminal investigation, uh, the, the state might seek access to it. Today, we hold our opinions in all sorts of ways and our opinions might be evidenced in all sorts of ways, right? We might, instead of writing a diary, right? We might, you know, write, uh, in a personal blog that we don't share with anybody, or we might take notes that we upload to the cloud and we even encrypt it so that nobody can have access to it. Uh, we may think that our opinions are shown in the way we browse, the information that we seek, the information that we, uh, that we download. Like all of those kinds of things might be evidence of our opinions and it's expanded the way we might think of the right to hold an opinion without interference. So perhaps we'll come back to this later, but what I wanna suggest, and I'll, I'll highlight this in a second further, is that this language in Article 19, even though it was drafted in a pre-digital age environment, very much can speak to our current situation online. Now, Article 19, paragraph two, is really the meat of, uh, of Article 19 in many respects. It is an absolutely robust statement of freedom of expression. And if you look at the language here, 
think a little bit about how expansive it is. The right of freedom of expression shall include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, and through any media of one's choice. Now, let's break this apart a little bit, right? First of all, what is the freedom? Well, the freedom is to seek, receive, and impart. That's, that's the action that's involved here. I find this language pretty interesting and also particularly relevant in a digital age. To seek and receive, we might think of as the right to, to browse, to search, to download, right? To receive information, right? It can also mean the kind of information you might receive through broadcast media, through print, whatever it might be. But it's also the right to impart information, right? It's the right to post, to tweet, to share information, to broadcast, to have your own, say, community radio, your own blog, whatever it might be. This is a right of seeking, receiving, and imparting. It's information and ideas of all kinds, right? There's no limitation here, which I think is very interesting, particular, particularly if you think about all of the debates today that exist around things such as disinformation and fake news. Article 19, paragraph two doesn't give us an easy answer to that because this doesn't say that everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression or to seek, receive, and impart truthful information and ideas uh, or correct information and ideas. It's information and ideas of all kinds. It's also information of, and ideas regardless of frontiers, right? So in other words, you have the right wherever you are to seek information beyond your borders. In, in some respects, this is a, a really fascinating three words, regardless of frontiers, in the sense that human rights law generally is understood in much the same way that international law is generally understood, which is that it's a territorial set of rights. In other words, the obligation is, to, is on the state in order to protect the rights of those within their jurisdictions. There's a suggestion here that even though that might certainly be true, that my right or your right extends extraterritorially, right? It extends beyond your borders. It is a right that you can enjoy regardless of frontiers. Again, if we think about this in the context of, of the internet, it's vast and fascinating to think that the drafters of this language could have the foresight to imagine a time when the media that we might consume might come from all over the world. Now, the idea here that this all would be uh, within the context of, me of any media of one's choice, orally, in writing, in print, in the form of art, through any media of one's choice, I think that's also fascinating because it opens up the possibility that the freedom of expression is not only kind of frozen in amber in 1966, right? As, okay, what are the media that we use in order to express ourselves? Well, it's newspapers and print, uh, it's radio, it's broadcast television, Yes, it might be art, it might be poetry, it might be painting, sculpture, whatever it might be, but it didn't limit itself. The drafters didn't say, these are the ways in which one can express oneself. No, it suggested any media of one's choice, which suggested the possibility of change, of evolution, uh, of, of technological advancement over time. Okay, so that's Article, article 19, paragraph two. And and I think it's, you know, it's the kind of language that certainly I, as a special rapporteur, but as any of you who are, are domestic lawyers will know, this language has a kind of echo in domestic law around the world. It's been incorporated into many national jurisdictions around the world. And it really sets a, a tone for how the freedom of expression, and this is something that was really emphasized by the Human Rights Committee, that is the monitoring body uh, for, uh, for the, the covenant on civil and political rights, uh, 
in its general comment 34 emphasized in its very first few paragraphs that the freedom of expression is foundational to democratic life. It's foundational to public participation. It's foundational to human development. And you can see that in this language, the tone, the thrust is to emphasize that very importance. Okay, so we've got a right to hold opinions without interference and we have a right to freedom of expression. Now, in, in my experience, states almost always agree that individuals enjoy these rights. Where the debate tends to focus is down here in paragraph three of Article 19. Now, paragraph three starts by, by with two points, I think, that are worth looking at. The first is that it only applies to paragraph two. So the restrictions in paragraph three on its face, right, on the face of Article 19, the restrictions in paragraph three do not apply to paragraph one. In other words, we can see textually that the right to hold opinions without interference is not subject to restriction. So that's one thing that we can kind of get out of the way with paragraph three really quickly. But then paragraph three says that the rights under paragraph two, that is the right to freedom of expression, carries with it special duties and responsibilities. Now, I would read that as tone more than anything else, right? That language is descriptive, right? It doesn't tell us anything about those duties and responsibilities, although you will often hear governments say, look, freedom of expression comes with special duties and responsibilities. Well, that's all tone. The question for us as lawyers is really to focus on what follows. And that is that Article 19, paragraph three, suggests that it provides, it permits states to restrict the right to freedom of expression, but, it's, but it provides that, that permission, let's say, in narrow circumstances. And we've come to think of this as a three-part test, although uh, it's, um, I would also think of these as, as really falling into two particular baskets. The first part of the test is that any restriction must be provided by law. Now, what does that mean? I mean, it could mean in its most narrow sense that any restriction on speech can't just be something or on expression, let's say, cannot just be something that the executive authorities, the presidency, the prime minister or whomever, or an agency of a government simply decides we're going to restrict expression. It has to be rooted in some law. And there's been jurisprudence that has developed over, over many decades around what this actually means. Does it just mean that there has to be a law that the government can point to that provides a basis for a restriction? No, it's understood to go beyond that. And that is that the law itself must be clear enough. It must be public law. So it can't be secret and, um, and provided in a way that the subject of regulation, that is the individual uh, speaker or artist or broadcaster or journalist or whomever doesn't know about it, it must be public, right? And it must be clear enough to provide guidance as to what is and is not lawful. It must be clear enough to provide some uh, limitations on the discretion of public authorities, right? So provided by law, is not merely a question of, is it in the law? Can you point to some law in your code? It's, it goes beyond that. We've, we've also understood it, and many people have written about this, and this has been a part of jurisprudence as well, as, as involving also public institutions to determine what is and is not lawful. In other words, provided by law, as a principle of legality and as a, pr a principle of the rule of law means that any restrictions should also be subject to the testing of an independent judiciary. And so this language provided by law as our first condition for a restriction provides us with a kind of baseline for looking at, uh, at legal authorities.
Okay, so that's, we think of that as in the three-part test as the first part. The second is necessity. So the restriction must be provided by law and it must be necessary. Now, what does it mean to say it's necessary? Well, law has developed, jurisprudence has developed over time to suggest that necessity includes the idea of proportionality. And, and it means that any restriction must only be as intrusive as is required in order to meet the objectives that I'll talk about in a second. It can be no more intrusive than necessary. It must be designed and have the purpose of achieving a particular, uh, a particular goal that is also legitimate. And one thing that I would emphasize here, it, particularly if you are going to be a practicing lawyer working in this space, is that the principle of necessity also includes the idea that the burden is on the government. The burden is on the public authority to justify and to show the necessity of any particular restriction. It's not on the claimant or the victim or the alleged victim to demonstrate that the restriction is not necessary. It's on the government's, it's the government's burden to make that demonstration. Okay, so as part of the test, legality, necessity and proportionality, and then finally, what we think of as legitimacy. So in order to restrict freedom of expression, you can't just say it's because, you know, we don't like that speech, or we don't like that art, uh, or we didn't like that blog post. It must be specifically designed, must be necessary, right, in order to protect the rights or reputations of others, national security, public order, or public health or morals. Now, there, there, are, there are a lot of things we could talk about here. I wanna just highlight a couple of points. The first is the, the A here, respect of the rights or reputations of others should be fairly clear in certain ways, right? And we might think of it as, for example, imagine that somebody wants to express themselves, they post something, and the thing that they're posting, let's say they're posting it on Facebook, is uh, the address of somebody that they don't like, right? So they wanna harass somebody. And so they, um, they expose where they live, where they work, and other particulars of that person's uh, private life. That's an interference with that person's right to privacy, which is protected under Article 17 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In that sense, it would be hypothetically available to a state as long as the restriction is provided by law and is drafted in a way that it is necessary to say, restrict the expression or to hold people accountable for expression that interferes with the privacy rights of others. We can also think of reputation as uh, acknowledging the possibility of defamation law. Although even if we think about defamation law, we need to be very careful because we know that there is around the world quite a bit of criminal defamation, which has largely been seen to fail to meet the, the burden of necessity in order to protect the reputation of others. So in, in this paragraph three, uh, part A, we can imagine some of the bases for a restriction on expression for the rights or reputations of others. Now, B gets into some areas that are quite a bit more difficult to, to think through. Protection of national security of public order. Now, we could imagine kind of a core of restriction. So for example, the state may be completely within its rights, right? In order to res restrict, let's say the, um, the publication of information about military maneuvers in a time of war, right? And you could imagine why that would be necessary for national security. Um, but over time, 
national security and public order. And those of you who are in, uh, uh, in India or in Kashmir in particular may know this particularly well, that national security and public order can often be used as a broad umbrella to restrict all sorts of expression in ways that are not only illegitimate, that is, they're really geared towards um, restricting public protest, but they're also vastly disproportionate because oftentimes, and this is certainly the situation uh, over the last several years in Kashmir, they involve disproportionate shutting down of communications, all for the alleged purpose of public order or national security. And then of course there's public health or morals. Um, the public morals part, I wanna to park to the side because oftentimes, um, and we could talk about it, oftentimes that is used as a, is a broad way for particularly conservative societies to restrict, say, the sharing of information about, uh, about reproductive health or about gender or about sexual identity. And those are very problematic. Um, and there's a very broad term, public morals, that I think is uh, frankly a bit unfortunate for the purposes of law. Public health though, particularly in the time of a pandemic, you can imagine a basis, right, in, in our all of our lives today, if we think about the kind of way that, that governments often wanna restrict the sharing of information about the coronavirus or about vaccines that can actually interfere with public health. And so we could imagine that as an instance of uh, states restricting expression on, on particular grounds uh, that, that might meet this, uh, this category. Okay, so all of this, right, under Article 19 is essentially designed to give us a framework that on the one hand promotes a robust understanding of freedom of expression, and on the other provides for a, um, a limited set of permissions for the state to restrict expression. Now, there is also here in Article 20 of the Covenant a requirement, right, that states prohibit propaganda for war and also prohibit, and here the language I think is very specific, although also opens up a lot of questions, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred, right? Advocacy of certain kinds of hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. So in other words, the state has an obligation under Article 20, right? To prohibit incitement that is based on this kind of hatred. Something that we might come back to particularly in the context of thinking about online speech. Okay, final thing. And here's where we're gonna, I'll spend the next 10 or 15 minutes and then I'll, I'll close um, on how we think about companies and states in this world of freedom of expression, right? So um, one of the things that has become, I think quite evident to all of us is that in the digital age, massive companies play a very central role in moderating our expression, in determining what is and is not possible to share with others. And there are open questions about what rules those companies should abide by. Now, states we think of, I'll talk about this in a minute, states regulate, right? companies moderate. That's the kind of language that's used around expression in the digital age and digital space. But we don't have a good way of thinking really of company obligations outside of state regulation, except for this. The United Nations uh, about 10 years ago adopted, and that is the UN's Human Rights Council, the central uh, human rights body in the UN system, adopted the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And it has three pillars. One is the state has a duty to protect human rights. We saw that in Article 19. We know that from human rights law. Human rights law imposes obligations, duties 
on states to protect and to promote freedom of expression. But that treaty language doesn't apply directly to companies. So in the absence of company of regulation by the state of the companies, there's a responsibility of companies to respect the rights that individuals enjoy, and particularly in an online setting, to respect the right of freedom of expression that individuals have, right? And then finally, there's third pillar is the right of remedy, that if an individual's uh, rights are interfered with, if they are restricted in ways that don't meet the standards of Article 19, Paragraph 3, they should have a remedy. Okay, so if you think about the structure of international law, we have the international law that's binding on the state, Article 19 of the ICCPR, and then we have the UN's guiding principles, which are non-binding, but which promote corporate respect for human rights. So what I wanna do is just very quickly um, introduce a couple of, of issues so that we can maybe shape our discussion a little bit. Um, as I said, companies moderate, governments regulate. That often leaves the users in a kind of uncertain space, but that's one way that we might think about it. So let me first talk, even though you know, hard law comes from the state, we can first talk about, in a way, the soft law of companies, right? So what do companies do? They adopt rules to flesh out their terms of service. And by companies, of course, in this context, I'm talking about you know, the big technology companies, um, uh, you know, the Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Universe, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, Snap, uh, Line, you know, in, whether we're, if you use uh, WeChat or if you use vContact in Russia, all of these companies do the same thing. They have rules to flesh out their terms of service. They provide for, I think of them as mini legislatures, um, to, to what they think of as making platform law, right? So they have rules, they enforce those rules and they determine them. They have tens of thousands of moderators, that is individuals around the world who are making decisions about, uh, about content, sometimes taking it down, sometimes leaving it up, sometimes relying very much on algorithmic decision-making, on artificial intelli intelligence, to surface what might be content that is uh, uh, interfering with their terms of service uh, and their rules. And, uh, and of course, I think that's, that's all natural when you think about the scale at which some of these companies operate. So this is what the companies tend to be doing. This is um, from Facebook's actual uh, website. This is their mini legislature. Uh, as, you, as you look at that, it, you might think, um, it's very interesting that these people, uh, who are all good people, sitting in uh, a room in you know the San Francisco Bay Area in California are making rules about content uh, for people around the world, right? You know, very distant from, for example, uh, you know, a, a, a you know a person who is using the service, using the product in Myanmar. India, Kashmir, the UK, Australia, you name it. But these are the people who are generally making the rules. Twitter has the same thing. They have rules, right? To determine what is and is not appropriate online. And of course, YouTube also has rules, right? And if you think about some of these rules, this gives you some of the categories of rules that YouTube looks to harmful or dangerous content, violent or, violent or graphic content, hateful content, nudity or sexual content. These are all issues that you could also start to think about in the context of what is a legitimate ground for restriction under international human rights law and should the companies be making decisions about content based on the human rights of their users or should they be making decisions on content based on their own decisions about what they want their platforms to look like. I think those kinds of questions become increasingly important for the biggest companies that have such a dominant place in our public space, in our, in our, um, in our public expression. All of the companies have what you might think of as hate speech 
uh, policies. Uh, Twitter calls it hateful con conduct. YouTube calls it harmful or dangerous content. Um, Facebook defines hate speech as a direct attack on people based on what they call protected characteristics. You can see some of this echoes the language of Article 20, right? Incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence on particular grounds. So there's a kind of similarity here. But this is also rules and rulemaking from companies that is you know, essentially based on their own sense of what they want their uh, platforms to look like. Um, uh, Vijaya God is the uh, general counsel at Twitter, and she highlighted recently, um, this is uh, much less than a year ago, that, uh, that Twitter is going to label tweets uh, when those tweets involve hacked content, right? So they're not only talking about the kind of content, whether it's hateful or something like that, they're, they're also talking about the provenance of that contact, content, which is, you know, in, increasingly uh, involving a kind of governance role. Um, I'm going to skip over this briefly just because, um, of course, you know, these kinds of issues, particularly around disinformation, have a particular relevance and resonance in the context of elections. Now, this was just a statement made in the context of the US elections uh, this past September. But of course, every government in democratic society has elections. And the question really arises whether the companies, uh, which are American companies, are doing the same kind of protective work that they might have done in the United States in all the places where they operate around the world. Okay, so that's company moderation. Now, now that's all in a kind of soft space that is often very much left to the discretion of the companies. But increasingly, governments are pushing back. And of course, governments, as we talked about a moment ago, governments have responsibilities to protect and promote freedom of expression. And so, they're pushing back in ways that are both legitimate and let's say in keeping with their responsibilities, but also ways that we might find to be illegitimate. Illegitimate. They're making direct demands of, uh, of companies. They're increasingly demanding that companies adopt codes of conduct for the taking down of conduct, content that often is not even illegal under domestic law. They're criminalizing users and criminalizing platforms in some places. They're imposing liability for harmful content without necessarily defining what harmful content is. We see these laws around the world. Of course, um, you know that there are analogs to the Communications Decency Act, Section 230 in the United States. There are analogs to that, which provides for, um, uh, for a kind of uh, immunity from liability, immunity from lawsuit for the companies in the United States. We have the same kind of rules in Europe and actually very similar rules in terms of notice and takedown kinds of rules, um, even in India. In fact, the Indian Supreme Court in, uh, in 2015 issued a decision that is very much in line with, although not in all its particulars, um, the, the idea that freedom of expression may be and should be enjoyed in online spaces as well. Now, the thing is, is that governments have created all sorts of policing units. So for example, Europol has a unit called the Internet Referral Unit in which they refer problematic content around terrorism and extremism, uh, terms that are very problematically uh, defined, if at all. Um, they refer issues and cases to the companies. That's a form of regulation that isn't even embedded in normal legal tools. It doesn't involve going through courts. We also see legal requests. This is a, from a couple of years ago, legal requests made by governments to Twitter around the world. You can see just by looking at this um, from 2018, and it's only increased since then, 
that some governments make expansive legal requests for Twitter to take down content. Here, you could see that India is in the category of 113 to almost 1,500. Um, that's only increased in the years since this. In fact, India and Pakistan uh, are both in that category of making significant legal requests to Twitter. And often, as you may know, those illegal requests are not, um, not always uh, made public. Often they're quite opaque in the work that they do and the requests that they make. We've also seen laws develop around the world seeking to restrict freedom of expression. We saw in Australia after the massacre in Christchurch uh, in New Zealand, Australia adopted a law which they call the sharing against the sharing of abhorrent violent material, which is essentially a law that restricts the, uh, the sharing of live streams. We've seen in Germany, their NetzDG, the Network Enforcement Act, which imposes penalties on companies that do not enforce German law uh, in the, a kind of robust way that they demand. We've seen Singapore adopt essentially a fake news law. They call it protection from online falsehoods and manipulation. Um, a law that gives extraordinary power to, um, to individual agencies to determine what should be taken down by making orders to companies to take down content. We've also seen the development of the right to be forgotten in Europe. And, and to focus here for a moment, because it's just, it's just so interesting and shows the interaction between state law and company behavior, after um, in 2014, the European Court of Justice ruled that certain people can ask search engines to remove specific results for queries in a search that includes their name, Google created a, a form that allows you to make a request uh, to remove or de-index a, um, a link that uh, includes your name in it. And one of the interesting things is Google itself says this, we will balance the privacy rights of the individual with the public's interest to know and the right to distribute information, which on the one hand sounds like, okay, that's an implementation of the right to be forgotten in European law, but step back and think about the, the, the fact that a company is standing in the shoes of a public authority and doing this very public-minded kind of balancing of privacy rights and the public's interest or public's right to know. I find this really astounding in many ways and not only astounding because of its transfer of power to promote and protect freedom of expression and privacy from the state to a private company, um, but also how many companies can actually afford to do this? So it reinforces the power of the companies as well. Okay, so we've seen through, and here I'm, I'm winding down. We've seen here that companies moderate content, governments regulate according to basic rules of freedom of expression, one hopes, but users often don't have many tools in order to object. They don't typically have rights to remedy in this space. They have tools, as you may know, to flag content, to report it, but, but otherwise users are essentially non-participants in platform rulemaking and in government regulation. So I, I wanna propose that we think about online speech through a human rights approach. And this is, this is my last slide. So the one we start with say private, and technology companies, an overarching question of legal environment. They should have rules that protect individual users' rights. Those rules should involve user autonomy, control, and education. There should be transparency, something that is, generally speaking, very difficult to come by. Those of you who are involved in or follow issues of online speech in Kashmir or in India know that oftentimes companies will take decisions and they will not explain what they're doing. The reasoning behind it is unclear. Did they take down content 
because it interfered with their rules or did they take down content because the government demanded that they take it down and on what basis? We should have more multi-stakeholder engagement that is users, civil society, academics, companies, all of those who make the internet work should be involved in the decision-making around rules that we're talking about here, not just governments. And let's think also about state and regulatory environment, particularly as there's so much happening. India itself is undertaking a, a new regulatory scheme to, uh, to regulate the internet in ways that probably steps up to the line, if not crosses the line of international human rights legality. We should, generally speaking, seek to avoid intermediary liability, except in, in the most narrow circumstances and according to principles of necessity and proportionality. The state should make sure that it's creating, maintaining, and promoting the legal environment for freedom of expression. There should be, in all regulation, basic rules, basic rule of law principles. To my mind, no government has adequately involved their independent judiciary in the evaluation of claims around online speech. Too often, as you saw in the right to be forgotten in Europe, they say, you should just handle this yourself, companies, according to these rules. I think we need to have a more, a kind of reinvestment in independent tribunals, independent public institutions to play a role here. And there should be basic transparency and public reporting requirements, essentially to go back to that principle that I highlighted in Article 19, Paragraph 3, the principle of legality, that everybody should know what the government is doing, why it is doing it, on what basis, what is the source of its law as it um, as it acts. So I'm going to end my slideshow there. Um, I could have left this up if you want to take a look at this one more time. But, but I hope that this has given you a kind of picture of international human rights law as a matter of what states are obligated to uphold and given us a little bit of a sense of the complications that arise when massive companies have such power over this space. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, I'll stop sharing and I'm really happy to hear any questions that, that you might all have. Excellent. Thank you, David, for that uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, this is a, obviously a very contested topic, so I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. But um, uh, before we take any questions, I was wondering if you could sort of expand a little bit on uh, your engagement with India, especially uh, after August 2019, when there was a, one of the longest communication lockdowns uh, in the history of any democracy. Uh, I know you, you wrote to the government a few times uh, requesting access as a special rapporteur. I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit on the response that, that you received from India. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, I wish there were a response that I could uh, characterize um, because the government has, has basically, I'd say in two respects, um, not responded to international concern about what I think of as frankly draconian steps to restrict expression in Kashmir. And of course, as those of you who are in India or follow politics and protest in India know, this is an issue in, in the context of the farmers protests as well. Um, so the, the two ways in which uh, I, you know, I would sort of highlight uh, the failure of India to respond are one, I sought uh, permission to visit India to conduct a formal country visit. Now, this is something that special rapporteurs do as a matter of course. And in fact, India has a standing invitation to special rapporteurs to visit the country. And so I wrote to India, I said, look, India is one of the most vibrant spaces for development of technology in the world. 
um, has a, uh, you know, a remarkable system, a remarkable education system, a remarkable industry for technology, I would like to visit and learn more about uh, how India sees regulating expression and regulating the tech industry uh, in the context of sort of a changing environment. I also was interested in sort of uh, evaluating the approach of the government to independent media, uh, to protecting uh, women journalists um, and, and many other issues related to freedom of expression. And uh, the government did not invite me to visit. Um, in fact, uh, I, I really hardly had a response to the request for an invitation to visit. And unfortunately, uh, human rights investigators from the UN can't just appear at the airport and uh, say, hey, we're here to conduct a visit. We, we really do need the invitation uh, from the government in order to do that. The second part of this is, um, you know, we raised concerns about Kashmir in multiple contexts. Um, after the, the communications shutdown, um, not only myself, but other rapporteurs uh, indicated to India our extreme displeasure uh, with that move and our sense that it um, quite evidently interfered with the right to freedom of expression of the people of Kashmir, and not only the people of Kashmir, it also interfered with the ability of people around the world. Remember, I, I highlighted that regardless of frontiers language. It interfered with, with my ability to obtain information from Kashmir, from whether they were activists or journalists or others. Um, we did not receive a response uh, from the government for that. Uh, I communicated with Twitter in the past as well because Twitter has taken down uh, Kashmiri accounts over the years with very little information about why it did so. Um, and I never received a response from Twitter either. So, I mean, it, frankly, the kind of response uh, that we've received from India over the years that I did as Special Rapporteur was, was really, I would say, modestly suboptimal and not consistent with what you expect from a state that is a party to the covenant and that you know, regularly uh, touts itself as the world's largest democracy. Excellent, thank you. Um, I know there are a lot of questions, so we will start. And as usual, the drill is, if you want to ask a question yourself, you raise your hand, or if you want to type your questions out, I will read them out to, to David. Uh, first question is by Safa. Can I ask Safa to unmute herself and ask the question? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kay, for your uh, wonderful and, and detailed talk in such a short amount of time as well. Um, I kind of, I wanted to jump into, I guess, the last part of what you're um, talking about in terms of human rights approach to online speech. And um, I mean, kind of the idea of possibly having some kind of self-regulation within, with, with people themselves. Um, I know there's kind of with, you know, this the idea of cyber libertarianism and blockchain and having people actually be able to regulate themselves versus having the state, uh, you know, regulate. Um, but in, in terms, you know, how would that actually manifest itself? And I mean, what are your thoughts on that? How would it manifest itself though on the ground when you have like in Kashmir where you have people being regulated by the state for things that they post in the cyber world? Um, which leads into the second part of my question. I mean, what um, we're talking, I feel like when we talk about uh, freedom of speech, we, we kind of tend to split it between, okay, well, your freedoms online in the digital world, and then you have your freedoms that when you're speaking physically in a room or in a, in a mosque, let's say. Um, uh, and, but what, um, in terms of the state intervening and accusing somebody of making online postings, uh, I mean, what are really, I, I, what are really the legal ramifications of that? Because when you somebody posts to Twitter, and they're posting something online, maybe um, you know, they post something that's anti-state, um, or that it's insinuating that it's anti-state, and after that, they're arrested. Um, you know, what 
what what can you know actually a state actually curbing somebody's online freedom of speech by actually physically you know right like being there and you know regulating them i mean where is that connection exactly um i mean we see this so much in kashmir as well where somebody will post something online and then they're you know arrested or um, hurt the next day so i'm just wondering about that connection um and thank you so much great um Saba, that's a great couple of questions and and maybe I can answer them or I'll try to answer them almost as, as if they're one question. Um, because I think there, there's an intersection, interaction between the things that you're raising, which are really important. Um, so the first thing is, you know, um, self, so self-regulation from my perspective, and this has come up in particular in discussions around this new Facebook oversight board, which some of you may, may have heard about and seen discussed, right? We shouldn't think about self-regulation as the end goal or sort of the final or even the best version for how this space should be governed. I, I rather think of self-regulation as the companies have responsibilities to ensure protection of freedom of expression and freedom of opinion on their platforms. And what do they do to promote that and to protect it? And that means what do they do both internally in terms of their own rules, right? And what do they do in the face, and this goes to your second question, I think in a way, what do, what do they do in the face of government efforts to restrict individual expression? Right, I mean, that, that role, it's a dual role that companies have, both the governance of the platform, right, which we could think of as regulation, but I, I like to think of as, you know, maintaining their, their, uh, their responsibilities under the UN guiding principles, but also they have this other role of responding to government demands, you know, whether it's, you know, the Indian government demanding of Twitter that it take down accounts or take down content, or it's, you know, the United States government uh, demanding that, uh, as you might have seen from some of the debate here, that the companies, you know, treat conservative and progressive discussion in the same way, right? So these are, these are all wrapped up in, in kind of an intersecting set of company responsibilities and the fact of largely non government regulation except where it comes when it comes to government demands so i think all of that means that we should think of this as first you've got you know what the company should be doing to maintain the human rights and protect individuals what what that looks like i mean you're raising a um, kind of a a dis dissertation level question about how we think about protection and that's i think it's and how we think about freedom of expression online. I mean, in my view, the companies are too big. They exercise too much power. They're, they're too opaque and they need to be, you know, we talk a lot in antitrust and competition policy about breaking them up. I think we should also be talking about breaking them down. So they're closer to the communities and users uh, who rely on them so much. Um, but we're also talking about, you know, kind of decentralizing expression so that remember if you think about the pre-social media space it was a lot harder for governments to interfere with expression because you know where would they go to restrict it now they just go to social media companies because everything has been filtered through facebook twitter youtube so that's you know one set of deep kinds of problems that we need to address and the other set of problems is you know in you you know the distinction between online and offline has been, I, th I think, broken down in so many fundamental ways that we should be thinking about company responsibilities in the context of fundamental human rights rather than you know simply thinking of them in this kind of specialized area of online speech. Um, the the Human Rights Council and others have talked repeatedly about you know offline rights applying online. It's a good mantra, let's say, but um, but we need to put, and this is maybe a challenge for all of us as lawyers, 
as to make that a richer, more real concept for people and explain what that really means. Excellent. Thanks, David. Uh, can I have Ifshan now? Uh, thanks, Samir, and th uh, thank you so much, Dr. K, for that uh, wonderful lecture. Um, my question is, uh, I think, the opposite of what Safa just asked. Um, I wanted you, if you could, like, talk about self-censorship uh, in the context of um, states not directly uh, attacking the freedom of expression or something which might not be very explicit, but um, through... So the rising surveillance systems, especially in Kashmir, or through intimidation tactics, as we've seen uh, very recently, there was like a mass, um, um, like there was um, uh, a lot of Twitter users were, um, were called in for questioning, which led them to leave the platform. So if you could uh, speak a little bit about that. Thank you. It's a, it's a really great question. Um, so surveillance, I mean, surveillance, intimidation, um, uh, you know, all sorts of pressures on, on both the companies and on individuals has become a real serious problem. And it's become a problem um, across the board, right? It's a problem and it comes up in all sorts of ways. So let's, I mean, let's first talk about surveillance, right? So I think everybody now is familiar with certainly since the Snowden revelations in 2013, people are familiar with the possibility and the reality of mass surveillance and the bulk collection by the state of private information, of personal information. So that's one set of threats um, that can in some respects cause a kind of general, maybe generalized fear right, that the things that we, I mean, everything, right, the things that we say, um, but also the things that we browse, right, you know, if you're doing research, the things that you purchase, right, that all of those things that constitute your, your whole self are somehow held by the state today. And I think that's, that's, that's a very big overarching theme, right, for you know, for the internet age as it exists today, and almost certainly has an influence on the way people think about um, what they're willing to say and what they're willing to do online. And it, and if so much of our lives uh, is online now, that that means a kind of generalized second guessing of oneself, or what Ifsha, what you call, which I think rightly self censorship, is certainly a part of. Right now, that's that's the government doing that. It's also the companies doing that, and oftentimes we don't have in different societies around the world a clear sense of the limitations on the state's ability to collect information that is held by private actors. So that's another layer of sort of integrating the surveillance by companies. And it, because it's their model, the business model of these companies is a kind of surveillance, how that connects to, to public authorities, to, uh, to law enforcement and so forth. That's one kind of surveillance. The other kind of surveillance is, I think the kind that you were suggesting perhaps more directly, which is governments around the world are using tools of, of both kind of the, <clears throat> the broad, you know, CCTV closed, you know, uh, surveillance at every street corner, which if you're in Kashmir, uh, you know far better than I do about the nature of that kind of thing that even going outside puts you onto a kind of surveillance uh, database immediately. Um, but it's also the kind of targeted surveillance that has been made possible by this growing industry of spyware that has been purchased by the Indian government, by the Pakistani government, by governments around the world in order to enable governments to target specific speakers. And that gets not only to surveillance, but also to your point about intimidation. And so surveillance is used as a form of intimidation of journalists, of people doing public protest, of organizers, of activists in real problematic ways 
that brings to light, I think for us, the fact that the right to privacy, right, which is kind of our first stop on the way of thinking about surveillance is very much directly connected to the right to freedom of expression or to freedom of conscience under Article 18 of the ICCPR um, or to the right to freedom of a peaceful assembly and association uh, under the ICCPR. So all of these things connect and surveillance is, I mean, generally speaking, one of the gravest threats to freedom of expression today, but not only because of the risk of individuals being detained um, and penalized, but also because of the, the very real possibility that robust debate is being minimized because people are less secure in their ability and willingness to speak their minds and, and to be in dissent. Thank you, David. There's a related question by Dania. She first thanks you for an insightful presentation uh, and goes on to say, you mentioned that users generally don't have a role to play when it comes to regulating the freedom of speech and expression online, except maybe to flag inappropriate content. In this regard, the government of India is said to have recently come up with a program that would allow users to report online content to the government as unlawful, even allowing people to register themselves as unlawful content flaggers pursuant to which the content may be removed by law enforcement agencies. What effect does this have on the right of freedom of opinion and expression of users on various social media platforms? I understand that it causes a chilling effect since citizens would in some sense be spying on each other, but does this government program violate the right per se? You know, I would say that that kind of, um, that kind of initiative is really problematic, but not, but not necessarily problematic on its face, right? On its face, right? Like we, we understand that in, I mean, even in democratic societies, if you see something unlawful, right? If you see a crime uh, in progress, you may report it to the authorities. And there's an expectation that you would behave in that way in many situations. The problem here is that even though you can imagine on its face, let's say, um, let's say you see somebody um, doxing someone else, right? Sharing the private information of someone else in a way that is illegal under domestic law, right? And you share that, right? That, that may be fine. On the other hand, you can also imagine, and this is the experience of, uh, of reporting, of flagging, it is also very much subject to a kind of mob behavior. Um, anybody who's ever um, kind of stuck their neck out and dissented from government, or let's say, I mean, I can say this from watching uh, and knowing uh, journalists, particularly women journalists in India, um, you know, criticizing uh, you know, the government, you know, an army of trolls comes after them. And you could imagine just that kind of thing happening to individuals who are in dissent becoming subject to that kind of harassment and, um, and kind of mob oriented um, reporting, which is already problematic on the, in online space because it's so easy for people to report in a mass coordinated way, perfectly legitimate content that they just don't like. And so imagine that power then being in the hands of the government. Uh, that could be you know, really deeply problematic. It could be um, used in a way that undermines uh, and restricts people's willingness to share information and to be active in public life. Again, it's one thing for it to be connected to what the companies are doing, it's another for it to be connected to the possibility of, uh, of the government assigning you know, penalties to, to that kind of behavior. So, so again, I think on the face of it, it seems you could imagine the reasoning for it, and yet it in all likelihood will be used uh, to, to kind of nefarious purposes that undermine freedom of expression.
Thank you. I know we just have about 12 or 13 minutes left, but there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, can I ask uh, Rahila Rashid to unmute and ask the question? And maybe I'll take uh, two or three questions in a row and then I can answer them together. Maybe that would get more questions. That would be great. Rahila, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, uh, Akshita, in the meantime, why don't you go ahead and ask the question? Sure, thank you, Samir. Uh, hi, Professor David. Uh, my question is more of uh, a general question. And I think this is something that uh, we all faced and we all acknowledged in some way last year during the pandemic. That is, how do you find a distance or like a balance between freedom of expression and the misinformation that is constantly spreading? Because like, especially given the power of online media, almost everyone has that freedom of expression and without even proper fact checking by the um, government or even other journalists who are reporting on the ground, a lot of things are spreading. And in this, especially related to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of misinformation was circulated. So how do you find a fine line between the two in a way? The second question uh, could be from Shub. Uh, she asks, could you briefly address how the denial of free speech opens the door to other kinds of wide raging abuses? Uh, the Indian internet blockade in Kashmir affected every aspect of life, education, medical care, economic and financial transactions. So the denial of the right of free speech became the means to attack the basic civilian necessities of, of life. Uh, maybe you could answer these two and then we can have Yusuf and Salman for the final two questions. Sure. So um, sort of the, I'll take the second question first because that's the easier one. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that we've seen over the last several years is how denial of freedom of expression isn't only about the denial of, you know, rights that affect democracy, public debate, public protest and so forth. It, it really does go, and this is something that is perhaps most evident in the context of website blocking and internet, internet shutdowns. And that is that even though fundamentally those are restrictions on expression, right? Those are restrictions on the sharing of information, on, on seeking and receiving and imparting information of all kinds, those kinds of uh, actions by government have real deep impact on economic rights, on social rights, on cultural rights. Um, they have very deep implications for health and education. And so clearly, and I think this is, again, this is really emphasized by the Human Rights Committee in General Comment 34, freedom of expression is a kind of gateway and a gatekeeper for all sorts of rights. And, um, and I think that's, that's really useful to keep in mind as we think about these issues, because whether you're a lawyer or an advocate or a scholar, it enables you to kind of open the door to, to how you know, one particular restriction can have a kind of knock-on effect across a whole range of, of social interests, goals, and, and individual rights. On, on the first question, the balance between freedom of expression and disinformation is, is really kind of one of the, like the big public policy questions of the day, right? I mean, how do we think about, first off in a public health context, right? How do we think about on the one hand, company responsibility to ensure that they are not platforms for promoting behavior that actually harms public health, right? So I live in a country where the, the president himself was probably the greatest source of that disinformation, right? Go drink bleach um, or something like that. And, you know, it's, I, I'm kind of, I'm embarrassed by that, to be honest, as, as an American. And so, but, but, you know, you have to think like a hard question at that moment, right, is, given the possibility of that kind of disinformation being spread and actually causing human health harm, what should the companies do about it? And um, 
And you know, the companies responded in all sorts of ways. Sometimes they would label it. The labeling, I think, has taken on a kind of, um, uh, you know, people now look at a label and they just go buy it and don't think anything of it. It's become normalized in a way. So what are the other tools that, that the companies have? And even more than that, should it be companies that are making the decisions as to what is good and bad public health decisions and public health information? I, like I said at the very beginning, I'm going to ask more questions than I would answer. You're, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm highlighting this right as, a, as an issue. On the other hand, right, government clearly does have the power it's permitted under Article 19, Paragraph 3, to restrict expression if it you know, can meet that three-part test in order to protect public health, right? And so you could imagine government imposing certain restrictions as long as they're necessary um, that do protect public health. The problem is it is very hard to limit those kinds of restrictions in a way that doesn't end up restricting also the right to share information about perhaps, for example, what you think the government is doing wrong, right? When does criticizing the government over its public health response get converted into a criminal charge for sharing public health disinformation, right? When does um, sharing information about a neighbor down the street who got sick um, become disinformation about the nature of, say, the vaccine or its effectiveness? So all of these things are really problematic, and I only... I'm, I'm responding by saying, you know, I don't have a particular answer except to say that what we absolutely do need is public participation in the making of these rules and much, much better transparency as to how both companies and governments are creating rules and enforcing them. And we don't have that. And, and I think that sort of to wrap this, this point up, it's one thing to talk about it in the relatively easy context of public health, even though there it's extraordinarily difficult when you sort of peel apart the issues. Imagine thinking about it in the context of politics and disinformation around political views or political issues. That becomes even more problematic because there's a strong, um, I think even, dominant theme in the law around freedom of expression that restrictions on public debate and political speech are extremely disfavored. So how do we think about disinformation in that context? Is it true, for example, that more speech is the answer to disinformation? Maybe, maybe not. Is it true that only dealing with, for example, the algorithmic you know, amplification of disinformation by the companies is the main problem. And if that's really the problem, how do we deal with that in a way that doesn't interfere with the ability of individual speakers to reach audiences? So very complicated issues that are, are really kind of centerpieces of public debate right now. Excellent, thank you. I'm very conscious of, of uh, time, uh, but I'll still have use of question and Salman's question, or I can always request you to be brief in your in your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. K, for such a beautiful insight. Uh, today's uh, webinar basically inclines with the work we are doing here. Our social media team in my organization track online hate, and we report it to the law enforcement and amplify uh, it to the mainstream media. So I have so many questions, but I'm restricting myself to just one. Um, so what, what's your thought on the BJP IT cell? Uh, you said you visited India, so you must be aware. So they use the bot technology and they're using 120 bots uh, compared to the other political parties. They use one bot 
to you know spread online hate these uh, you know they have paid uh, workers working for it cells they spread online hate and they have a ripple effect because you know often these extremists were sitting behind the uh, scene they connect with the white supremacist group and this online hate has resulted in the quebec attack um, and the new zealand attack and also one of our volunteers were killed a few months ago so as a result of this online hate so how can we stop this bjp it cell legally that's my question so much hi uh, thank you uh, thank you prof for for very informative um, presentation i got a three points just observation to made and um, I, i'd like to ask a question at the same time is one um, just to just to what uh, the Yusuf have said about the cell, you know, if you you have to go where the most of the information has been circulated is on the social media, and if you go Google, you will be able to see and find out that most ten top social media company out of the top ten, seven seven of them the CEO is the Indians, and I'm talking about not the American Indians; they are actually the diaspora India, those who control. One. Secondly, uh, Prof, I went to your account and I look at it. I cannot send you a tweet because my account has been filtered. Every time I try to send you very info, info, important information uh, about the, you know, the violation of the human rights or the expression, freedom of expression, I cannot send you any. But I see on the same time, your page, a Twitter account especially, is full of anti-India, uh, sorry, anti-Pakistani and Pro, uh, pro Indian and anti Kashmiri uh, information. So that definitely there is a filter there. One and and uh, the my last one will be that of course you know this is the, that's definitely a problem there that these tech CEOs are controlling the information landscape, social media landscape, and of course they're all the time. Um, um, you know, the delay, deleting the accounts, and I can't send you the tweet. I do not know why. I mean, I don't know. Every time I send, it just doesn't appear onto your side, and I can't communicate with you. Now, when I, I want to go on to something of the law, which I find a little problematic, as you are in a preamble, um, when it says the Article 19, everybody should have the right of a whole opinion without interference. And then the second one, it, it, it's give me some sort of a, a little bit of a more problem that everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive, impart information, and the ideas of all kinds, regardless of the frontier. Looked like to me when the 1966, this law was written, it was more of like espionage and, uh, and you know, colonial power, spies going into the world. And if you get caught, you know, you can go, regardless of the frontier, you can seek, receive, and impart information. So you can't be, you, you, you have an impunity in a way by United Nations, but Today, that law, it doesn't apply in Kashmir or India. So it's created a problem for me because, you know, as much as all the beautiful laws are there, but they are the soft law. I mean, you are asking India to go. It's like you asking criminal, can I come into your house with a warrant of arrest to arrest you? No, you should be just knocking the door and kicking the door and break the door and go and arrest people and issue the thing. But the law is there, but it's so soft. That imagine you have to ask a human rights commissioner, have to ask Modi government, can we go, can we kindly go to your country to see if you are killing or geno committing the genocide, genocide? So it's a dichot for me uh, of its own. So I think that there's a problem, and I think we need to put more, um, more emphasis, emphasis on how the United Nations can become more powerful to like a, not like a toothless tiger, um, but I always say this thing same laws become very applicable and forcefully. Within an hour, you have seven resolutions issued to go and turn Afghanistan and to, to uh, Iraq into the Stone Ages because wearing the burqa no, and the cops, the people, the woman with the naqab was danger to the democracy. But when the people have been maimed and killed and tortured in Kashmir, the same United Nations laws are not applicable. It's mind boggling. Thank you. Hey, thank you for thank you for these questions. I know we're we're out of time, so. I can't really spend much time answering answering them. I think I would say um, first to Yusuf, I, I actually have not visited, in, I did not visit India as part of my mandate as special rapporteur because India did not, the government did not invite me. So um, 
which is uh, an essential um, threshold in order to conduct an official mission. So, I mean, the thing that I would say in response to, to your point on, on bots and, and hate is unfortunately, and this is a global problem around the world, people in power are often using the tools of, of hate, of in the language of hate and bots, the technologies in order to promote hateful content. And it's much harder to deal with public authorities who already have a platform. This isn't only about what they can, can and cannot say on, you know, on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. They already have a platform. They can get you know, in front of the, the entire country, if not the world, and spread any kind of information that they want. So there, it's very hard to restrict that kind of information. That said, the companies themselves, I think over time have understood that they have a responsibility to deal with that. Some of them deal with bots by trying to, um, inter to, to interfere with what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior, CIB. So it's coordinated inauthentic behavior. If you Google that, you'll find all sorts of information about it. And so what some of the companies try to do is they deal with bots with the, the kind of inauthentic expansion and amplification of information by using uh, that as a kind of heuristic to identify content they wanna take down. As for the issues that, that Salman raised, I mean, all I would say there is, because I'm not exactly sure what the question was, is that um, you know, the freedom of opinion and expression is binding law under, um, under Article 19, under this, uh, uh, the ICCPR, it's binding on all states. All states are required to integrate that into their domestic law so that it, it comes, it, it's translated from maybe the, what you were calling kind of a toothless universal law into actual binding um, law with teeth at the domestic level. And to a certain extent, that's what we need to be calling upon as lawyers, which is calling upon governments, not only to make sure that that law is a part of their domestic law, but also to make sure that they adhere to it according to the standards provided by international human rights law. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sorry that I spoke uh, so long at the, at the outset and didn't allow for as many questions, but the questions that were asked were really fantastic. And I'm, I'm, I hope that it provides a basis for a discussion in your seminar as well. It, that's a good way to remind people that we have our seminar day after tomorrow on Saturday, 27th March from 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. GMT. Thanks a lot, David, for spending your morning with us and, and you know, with your brilliant presentation on, on Article 19 and taking all these questions in, in such a wonderful manner. Um, and thank you, everyone, for participating in, in, in this engaging discussion. Uh, I will see all of you on Saturday. And uh, thanks a lot, David. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to everybody. Bye.